Hey, how's it going guys? Jack and Matt here with the Toaster Bros. And today we're gonna to be showing you guys how not to build a PC. Most of these are mistakes that we've actually made in the past and learned from with years of experience. So let's talk about that. But first, a word from today's sponsor. Today's video is brought to you by Vite Ramen, some of our favorite ramen out there. Now you might be wondering why as a tech channel we would want to partner with a ramen company. Well, Vite Ramen was founded by twin brothers Tim and Tom. Tim played collegiate overwatch for UC Davis and didn't have time to make nutritious meals while doing school life and esports, and because of that, Vite Ramen was created. Speaking of nutrition, these things are packed full of protein, all the essential vitamins you need, and enough calories to, well, keep you going, because you know your body needs them calories to survive. So we have a few of the really good options here. We have pork, we have chicken, and we even have vegan. One thing that we also really love about Bite Ramen, especially in a time like this, is that they really invest into their employees. They do things like no question asked mental health days slash sick days, and also they just do livable wages, which is really essential nowadays. If you want to support this awesome company that just happens to make really awesome ramen noodles, check the link in the description down below and use our discount code on checkout to save a little bit of money. But thanks again to Bite Ramen for sponsoring this video. How I suggest these noodles, we'll go eat them all right now. Let's go eat them. All of them. So how about we go ahead and start off with our list with number one, and we'll use these PC parts for demonstration. So number one is don't push down too hard on certain things that you shouldn't. There are some things that you should, and we're gonna show you those first. So number one is RAM. RAM is something that you actually do have to press down. So we'll do a quick demonstration with one of these dims. Make sure that you line up this guy here and make sure both of those are open too. All right, and then you gotta put some force on it because these guys are spring activated. They close on their own. And same with pulling it out pretty much. You gotta put some force on them. So RAM, that's one. Second is graphics card. This is gonna be a little bit hard to demonstrate, but once again, you just line it up. There's really only one way it can go in. And you are gonna have to use a little bit of force. You'll hear it pop. And then there's actually this little guy back here. You'll see that pop in place as well because once we take it out, you gotta actually really, oh, it went back on down on me. <laughs> <laughs> it's stuck. Ah! There we go. So those are two things that come to mind of things that you should push in. Also, I don't have an example, but M.2 is another thing that you kind of have to put a little bit of force to push in, but we're going to show you now one thing that you should not push in. Okay, guys, so what we have here is a Ryzen 3200G. This is one of the things that you do not want to push too hard down on. So this is with any processor, Intel or AMD. AMD actually has the pins on the actual chip. You see how these are all nice and straight? I don't really know if the camera is that great, but nice and straight pins. So all we should have to do is line up this arrow right here with this arrow, okay? And make sure that the latch is open. And then we just drop it in there. Now, if it doesn't go right in, what I usually like to do is like, let's say we got it off to the side a little bit, okay? So it's off to the side. You just gently, see? All we had to do there is just kind of guide it in and then it locks into place like that. You do not want to push down on the processor because that's how you get bent pins, whether they're on the actual board or on the processor themselves. Bent pins make the PC not work. And the last thing that I can honestly think of that you do have to kind of push in as well is power connectors. This right here is actually a SATA connector. This is how you do data transfer for your hard drives and whatnot. So you're gonna line this up. And once again, these don't just fall into place. You gotta actually kind of push them in. So it's the same thing with stuff like the 24 pin, which Matt will show you. So we got 24 pin, we have the CPU, we have the GPU, uh, PCIe power. We have all kinds of other connectors. A lot of those take a lot of force. Like this one here, I'll just show you a demonstration on how hard it is to get out. So not easy to get out and not easy to get in. So those are ones that you also have to use a little bit of force with. But once again, if you're going excessive with it, nothing in a PC should take so much force that you're like having to, you know, put a lot of muscle into it, just, just a little bit. Mistake number two is using too little or too much thermal paste. Now we're actually gonna be demoing this right here with this Ryzen 3 1200. We're gonna go ahead and install it in the slot like Jackson showed you just a little while ago. Let that go in there, you know, no pushing down and then put the lever down right here. But anyways, what we're gonna be doing is putting thermal paste on this, which thermal paste is right here. We use the Arctic MX4. Arctic sends the stuff over, special thanks to them. But anyways, what we're gonna be doing is showing you how to apply thermal paste. Now, if you are doing a new build, there is a chance that the cooler like this one will come with thermal paste pre-applied on the bottom and that is perfectly fine. You just install the cooler and that thermal paste will normally work all right. But if you do experience any temperature issues, you may wanna go back and reapply the thermal paste with something like this and clean off this cooler and make sure it's getting adequate contact. Now there are a lot of different methods you can go with for thermal paste, but the one method I normally use is kind of like the P method. So you go ahead and do a dot about that big. So 
kind of the size of a pea. You can go a little bit more or a little bit less, but you definitely don't want to empty the entire tube. You definitely don't want to have thermal paste oozing over the side because one, if that gets inside the motherboard socket, you could kill the motherboard and the CPU if you do do that. Um, and also it just makes it a lot easier to clean up. But uh, rule of thumb is just to run the P method right here. And then what we can do is go ahead and install this cooler and we'll take it off to show you how the spread actually worked when we put it on there. So I'm gonna go ahead and do this and then we'll put the cooler on. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and install our CPU cooler here. We like to do a little cable management here, like hide it behind these cables just to make things a little bit nicer. So we're gonna go ahead and lay it down right here. And just a little extra tip, uh, be sure to screw in the corners each time just a little bit so you don't overstress one side of the cooler and make some mistakes. And also back to the first tip, sometimes this cooler, you do have to push down a little bit hard to screw this in because just the way AMD has this made, sometimes your screws won't automatically hit the risers a little bit. See how I'm applying a little bit of force just to get it started. You go ahead and screw all the way in, and yeah, we'll be good to see what kind of thermal paste application we have, which is a common issue people do have when they do install their CPU coolers, not screwing it in all the way because, well, you're not making full contact with the CPU, therefore the thermal paste cannot do its job. And that right there is nice and firm. Be sure to plug in your CPU cooler right here to the CPU fan port. There we go. And boom, technically your build is ready to go. You could hide this cable if you wanna make it a little nicer. And yeah, there it is. What we're gonna do is go ahead and undo exactly what I did just to show you how the thermal paste spread actually worked and to show you that this is kind of the ideal amount of thermal paste. Ideally, you'd wanna turn your system on first, see what kind of thermals you're getting because sometimes the thermal paste needs to get activated and kind of forms into the CPU to get better contact. But right now we're just gonna go ahead and just show you just a general idea of how well this thing spread as we uh, put the pressure of the CPU on top of it, the pressure of the CPU cooler on top of it, that is. <laughs> okay, and there we go. That was actually a pretty decent spread. You can see right here, if you center it a little bit better than I did, you might be able to cover all of this right here. But mainly with the CPU, the main cores are within like the center of the die. So as long as you get most of the thermal paste spread out throughout this CPU core in the middle, you should be perfectly fine. You might save like a degree or two by getting all of this all over the CPU. But yeah, that's it. Don't do too much, don't do too little, do exactly that much and you'll be perfectly fine. So number three, and this one's a very generic one, but we really could not leave it out, is hardware compatibility. So what you guys saw here was a A320 motherboard with a Ryzen 3 1200. So these are both perfectly compatible because this board supports first gen and this is a first gen CPU. It supports the wattage, which is another important thing to make sure that your motherboard supports the proper wattage. Speaking of wattage, the power supply is another very important thing to watch out for because if you get a power supply, that cannot provide enough wattage for like the GPU and the CPU, which are the main two uh, power consumption sources, your computer is gonna randomly shut off. It's not gonna run well. You could even start fires and whatnot. You could blow up capacitors. So just be careful. Make sure that you select the proper things. We really suggest Newegg has a PC part picker list. PC part picker has a part picker list. Micro Center has a PC part picker list. Basically every like major website now has PC part picker list. And not to mention, I know you guys love to ask us all the time, will these things work together? Well, if you join our live streams on twitch.tv slash Toaster Bros, you can ask Matt a million to, oh crap, I'm in all the live streams no. now. He can ask both of us. But as a rule of thumb, just be sure to triple check everything. We've actually done builds here before where we had to delay them because stuff was not perfectly compatible. So we just really recommend spending about 30 minutes to maybe an hour and a half just planning your build. Don't just go willy nilly buying parts unless you've been doing this for 8 million years like it feels like we have. All right, so this mistake is very common. The concept of running single versus dual channel in your system and how you should install single versus dual channel memory on your motherboard. Now, there are two types of motherboards in most use cases. There are really high-end ones that have more RAM slots, but most of the time there's two RAM slots like this A320 board right here, or with this B450 board, there are four RAM slots. Now, if you're running a system like this, you normally will be running it in dual channel, but if you do run it in dual channel, you have to follow a certain set of rules. With most AMD motherboards from our experience, you want to install the RAM DIMMs in these two slots, two and four. In most cases, that is what the motherboard's gonna ask for. If you do want to triple check, the motherboard manual will tell you which RAM slots to install two sticks of RAM in. And if you want to do three for whatever reason, there is a certain order to install those in. So you could do two, three, four, or maybe it'd be two, three, and one. It really depends on the motherboard manufacturer, but in most cases, you're just gonna run two sticks of memory for the best compatibility and performance and you normally run them in two and four slots. But if you are running one stick of memory, most of the time you just run it in two. So you'd go in this slot right here. 
So what we have right here are two sets of memory. One is a single channel kit, which is eight gigs, and the other are two four gig sticks, two configurations that most people would go with. So I'm gonna go ahead and install single channel real quick, which is this one right here, into this slot. I'm gonna try to do it this way because, well, I'm not wanting to sit this down. Click it in, make sure it's nice and firm, and boom, there is the single channel memory installed into this system. Now, if you wanna go ahead and do dual channel, go ahead and, well, pull this out, but obviously you won't have any in there right now. Go ahead and install the first First one in here, like so, if you do it the right way, unlike I just did, and then click down, make sure it's firm, and then you're gonna go ahead and go over to the next slot. Most of the time you can tell that they color coordinate this so you don't mess up. These are two gray slots as opposed to the darker gray slots right here. So we're gonna go ahead and do the exact same thing and make sure it clicks in nice and firm. And there you go, dual channel is installed and there. You normally get better performance in dual channel anyways. We preach all the time, if you're doing a Ryzen based build, go dual channel. Even Intel based systems, especially their laptops, you really wanna go dual channel to sometimes get like 20 more frames in a game. It really does make a big difference. And later in this video, we'll talk about another thing you need to do once you install your RAM that makes a massive difference, especially with Ryzen. So the next mistake, this is tip number five, is make sure you install your drives on the right SATA port. So if you're running a singular SSD or even a singular hard drive, you're going to have to be sure to use SATA one or SATA zero. It's going to go both ways. If you have a zero, always use zero. If you have a, a one and no zero, just use, you know, one. So this one actually has a zero and I'm gonna show you guys real quick on this one, just, you know, for fun. This is zero because see zero, one, two. So we're gonna use zero. And then you, you know, plug your other end in to the actual SSD and obviously you have to power it up and everything with a power connector. But this is exactly how it works. Now, let's say I wanna add a secondary hard drive. So we're actually gonna use something like say to one and we're going to add the hard drive onto that one. So whatever your OS is on, you want to use say to zero. So make sure that you don't use say to zero for something like a secondary hard drive or like your DVD drive. You always wanna use zero or one for your main Windows boot drive. Mistake number six is installing your fans in the wrong direction in your case. Now, a fan is, well, pretty straightforward. Air comes in, air goes out. That's pretty much how this works. And a fan like this, this 120 mil fan, will have two ways of installing it. One, you can have an exhaust configuration or you can have an intake configuration. Now you might be wondering what that even means. Now, if you look at this fan right here, you have this front side with the label. And if you look on the side, you have an arrow. Now the arrow points the direction the air is flowing. So air is coming in through this front right here when the fan spins and comes out here. So I Ideally, you would have this configuration installed on the front of your case if it has like mesh up front and 99% of the time that's the way you're gonna be doing it because you want air to come into the case and then exhaust out the back of the case. But in some situations you may have a case like this that has a mesh top and maybe you wanna have exhaust on the top. So you wanna make sure you're pointing this side up. And a good rule of thumb is I like to call it the ugly side of the fan because you can actually see the cable behind it. This is always exhaust. You'll normally see the cable run here or you'll just see, well, not the logo on the front or the fancy RGB you normally see on a case. Um, but this right here is the exhaust, always gonna be the exhaust. And again, as I mentioned, you could find these little arrows right here if you want to, but just make sure you install it properly because if you do have temperature issues, there could be a situation where you have a exhaust fan blowing air out and have no air coming in, it can cause negative pressure and have problems inside the case where things are going to start overheating and things like that. So definitely keep it on your fans. Just take a moment to look at it. We've done this many times, even though we've built many PCs. It's a very common mistake. One more quick thing. The main reason you do a configuration like this, while there are many fan configurations you can do, is the fact that heat rises and the way the air flows is it will pull air in from the front. The air will come in through here and normally you'll have an exhaust up here and exhaust right here the air can just disperse out the hot air is around the cpu area normally in the graphics card so towards the back of the case that's normally where you want to get all the hot air out so the cpu gpu and all the other components are nice and cool so that's normally the configuration you run with normally in our builds we'll have like two or three rgb fans up front one right here maybe two more fans up top just to dispel all that hot air um, but yeah it's a really ideal configuration you can go other ways too if you want a bunch of pressure going in or out there's been tons of videos of people experimenting with this and normally the difference is very minimal and a lot of people do it for dust management control also that's something to consider but just for the scope of this video just make sure you're running a decent air configuration where you have enough air coming in and air coming out and normally we like to match that so two fans coming in two fans out three in three out that sort of deal so number seven is installing the front panel stuff not in the right spot. So this one's pretty straightforward and honestly most of you guys are gonna get this right. But as you can see, F panels, which you're often gonna see in 90% of the time in new boards, 
they actually have it laid out what is what. So that's a really nice feature that most boards included. It is really tiny though, so you get out your magnifying glasses, kids. But um, it doesn't really hurt if you install this stuff backwards. It's just gonna be a pain to have to go back through and redo that. Matt will show right now what it looks like when the stuff's installed. A lot of really small stuff. So the most important one, obviously, is gonna be your power switch. I'm gonna go ahead and pull these out. But once it's in the case, it's really hard to see. Now, I will say it's a pretty common configuration that the power switch is going to go right up here, just like with that one. And just like with the fully ticks board, it's right up here, these two pins. It's almost always going to go horizontal and not vertical, unless it's like an OEM board. So like this one's pretty straightforward. Sometimes it's not written on the motherboard. If that's the case, just look it up on Google, uh, check out your motherboard manual. They'll usually tell you where to plug these in. Also, every case has a different amount of these. Some cases don't have a reset switch. Some cases don't have power LEDs. Some cases don't have hard drive LEDs. So just make sure that you look at all your pins make sure you look at what the board has and just make sure you plug everything in right because you don't want to have to go through and redo all of this. Now, tip number eight is something that you need to be very careful with because we've had issues where we've replaced PC parts multiple times thinking that it was actually hardware related, but it's installing an extra riser into your PC case. Now, most PC cases nowadays come with the proper amount of risers, but if you don't know what a riser is, by the way, these are things that are in the bottom of the motherboard tray that you screw the motherboard into so it attaches to the case. They're normally like gold or sometimes silver or black. It really depends on the case. But anyways, those risers, when they accidentally make contact Contact to the back of the board if they're not lined up with the proper mounting holes can cause problems where the system will not turn on sometimes you can kill a motherboard by doing that because you're literally putting metal on metal contact which is not good which any of these mini like traces back here if they touch the back of one of those risers they could fry the board and cause a lot of problems as you can tell there's a lot of different things going on behind here but you have to be very careful because there are some case manufacturers that will put a ton of risers in there and you just got to make sure you're not sitting one on top of a motherboard Board that is not actually a screw hole because it can cause a lot of problems. And also this thing looks ugly. As you can tell, there's an extra little riser right here. That's not causing any problems, but it's just kind of hanging out there right now. Most PC cases will come with this little tool that'll allow you to remove risers. Trust me, it helps a lot. All you gotta do is put it on the end of a screwdriver and there's a little hole that can go over the riser real quick. So we'll go ahead and do that. And all you have to do is unscrew it. And from here, you can pull it out and boom, there is your riser removed and it's out of sight. So definitely recommend doing that. And also keep hang on to this tool once you finish your build. It's very useful because removing risers can be a really big pain if you don't have something like this. So yeah, tip number eight, be sure to remove extra risers. So tip number nine is this. You guys, some of you might be wondering, what is this? So this is actually called a IO shield. It goes right over this. This is what basically protects the PC from getting excess dust, you know, possibly putting stuff inside the PC as extra. And as you can see, this right here is missing the IO shield. And I know you're probably wondering, go ahead and install it. You can't, you literally have to take the whole motherboard out because these shields, which I'll go ahead and open this one up. So obviously this one's not for this motherboard, but just to show you, they literally make them the right size to fit in. And it goes in on the inside, by the way. I know you're probably thinking it would fit, but you literally have to put it in through the inside and this is in the way. We can't do it now. So we have to take the whole entire motherboard out. You'd have to take the whole build apart too if you forgot this. So make sure that you install this before you put the motherboard in. And it's just such a new mistake. We've done it a few times. Luckily, we managed to catch it right after we put this in. All right, guys, last but certainly not least, we're gonna be doing mistake number 10, and that is not enabling XMP in the BIOS. Now, for those who do not know, XMP is basically enabling overclocking on your RAM or setting your RAM to its rated speed. Now, for example, what we're gonna do here in this Gigabyte BIOS is go under the Advanced Frequency Setting option, click on this, go underneath here, and you'll be able to see... <laughs> and inside this menu, you have right here the Extreme Memory Profile, or XMP for short, and what you're going to do is go ahead and hit on enable and profile one will normally default to whatever the speed is of the RAM that is installed in the system which I did not know was 3600 megahertz is that right is that wrong I don't know <laughs> but one thing to keep in mind when you do run XMP it may not be 100% stable now it is very important for Ryzen systems to at least give it a shot because the faster the memory on Ryzen normally you get a lot of performance out of it along with the dual channel thing that we mentioned earlier in this video so we're gonna go ahead and set this to 3600 megahertz you'll want to post it play some games, make sure you don't have any blue screens. But if you do experience blue screens and crashes, you can go back into here and manually set the RAM speed that you want to. So for example, we'll disable XMP, go back under the advanced memory settings. And if you want to, you technically could dial in whatever frequency you want. A common frequency would be 2133 or 2666, which we'll do 26 right here. 
So what you would do is type in 2666, which would make the memory frequency 2666. You can go 2933. Those are normally the increments you go with, but normally I recommend straying away from this and trying XMP first because it normally will work more likely than not. And well, if you want to dive in and do some manual tweaking, you can do it this way as well. So those were just 10 of the things that we could think of at the top of our heads that people often make when building a first PC or even PC veterans. We do this stuff all the time. Sometimes we're just not thinking straight and we end up building a ton of computers and just stuff like this messes us up along the way. But it is something you definitely should keep in mind when you are building your first gaming PC or as Jackson mentioned, your thousandth gaming PC. You do need to make sure you're not making these mistakes. It'll save you a lot of headache in the long run. So if you guys haven't already, don't forget to follow us over on Twitch.tv slash Toaster Bros and also check out our other two YouTube channels. We really appreciate some follows and subscribes. Also leave a comment in the comment section down below if you have had any of these problems yourself, what the worst problem that you've had, and if you have any input on problems that you think we should have added to this video. So don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. And we'll see you guys in the next one. Goodbye, PC builders. <laughs>